first of all, um, this is a very interesting topic, and if you especially followed last week's development about AlphaGo and things like that, what you can see is, is there's so much happening in this space now. And I have 15 minutes to present this topic in context of smart city, so it's not a lot of time. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to you about some of the research we have been doing. Uh, as, as, as I was mentioned, I, I wear a few hats. And um, I teach at Oxford University. So that is uh, one of the, how does this go ahead? Uh, how does this go ahead? Ah, here we go. Perfect. Yes, I don't know what's supposed to point something here. So I, I, I teach at the University of Oxford, and I, 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 my main course there is Data Science for Internet of Things. And I also teach at the University of Madrid, uh, which is a smart city's only master's, uh, and it's called City Sciences. And this, uh, all I'm going to talk to you about now is based on the work we are doing in Madrid, in, in Spain. And it is based on apply, application of deep learning and also with some of my students who are here. So these are my students who have been participating with me on this project. And uh, really what we thought about was this, and also we were working with a few companies. Now I won't mention the implementation details of this because it is quite complex to get into some of these areas, especially the technology behind it. So I will just say that we are working with some very interesting companies, both in Oxford and in Madrid, like NVIDIA and, and so on, who are uh, very much involved in deep learning. So, this is an interesting statement. I'll start with this. So this is something I read before, and of course many of you would know Marshall McLuhan. And he says that man becomes the sex organs of the machine world, the bee of the plant world, enabling machines to evolve ever new life forms. So think about it in this way. Think about it that perhaps we humans are just pollinating agents for the robots. And maybe we are starting something which we don't know where it's going to end. We're helping the robots to breed, quote unquote, yes? Uh, and what does this mean? And what does this mean? And there is lots and lots of discussions about this subject. We can go and talk about this a lot. And we thought of applying this to, to applying this to smart, smart cities. And firstly, to understand what I'm gonna say, I have to talk to you about deep learning. Now within 15 minutes, I can't talk to you about deep learning. This is gonna be the shortest ever introduction to deep learning ever. And I think the best way to talk about deep learning is to understand a specific type of problem which computers can solve very easily, but humans cannot. So if you look at the chess problem, which the, the sort of the deep blue solved uh, as many as about 20, 25 years ago, uh, the problem of chess is very easy for a computer to solve because it's a finite world. Yes, it's 64 squares with pieces which behave very rationally and very, very, very planned way. Therefore, a computer can, quote unquote, get all the analysis using brute force algorithms. That works very well. What doesn't work for a computer is recognizing a, 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 recognizing a face or recognizing a dog. Uh, you can have all kinds of dogs. You can have chihuahuas, boxers, alsatians. You can have, they can have collars. Uh, they can have cropped ears and so on. So when you look at a picture of a dog, it's not very easy to recognize what a dog is from a computer's point of view. A child, of course, can do this very easily. Now, perhaps some of the, if you know what this is, you, most of you would know what this is. This is uh, AlphaGo last year, uh, last week. And this is a major development in terms of artificial intelligence. And the reason why this is so interesting is, is a specific technique of deep learning which is being used by Google and so many others, yes? And that technique is called reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning, to think about reinforcement learning in my very brief introduction to deep learning, think about it like Pavlov's dog. Yes, so or think about it by learning, by blundering, if I may say so, yes. What that happens is that you are given a certain problem and you are asked to find, by you, I mean the computer or the machine, is given a certain problem, given lots of data about it, and asked to find a solution. And if it finds, if it does a proper step and you give it a reward, and if it does a wrong step, you don't give it a reward. So by assigning or planning a series of rewards and not having data sets to actually train the algorithm, the machine learns by itself. Yes, and this is the key bit here. The key bit here is that the machine, so if you look at the classic supervised algorithm versus unsupervised learning, so you need to have some kind of a supervised a training data set. You need to have spam versus non-spam or something like that. In this instance, you don't have any such thing. What you have is a series of rewards 
and you let the machine go and you let the machine learn over many, many, many iterations. And over time, it does amazing things. So what kind of amazing things? Uh, this was something now seems very old now. This was a year ago. This was uh, even a few months ago. This was a huge thing where um, D DeepMind learned to play Atari and Pac-Man. And what it does here is that it learns by observation. So it does, you don't even tell the machine what the objective is. All that you tell the machine is that you observe a series of things and you observe that yellow blob thing going around all of that. Even that is not told to the machine. All you tell it is that this is what happened and this is the score. And when you continue to do this for lots and lots of times, the machine learns by observation. Yes, and this is the key aspect of deep learning or the key um, development of deep learning which is making such a big impact today. Yes, so if you look at that particular aspect and then apply to see how it applies to smart cities and you, you, uh, that's what we are trying to think about. This was our research problem. We started off with this problem of smart cities like everybody else does and I think the previous couple of speakers mentioned this. The smart cities has become a very silo solution. So everybody looks at security, transport, health, governance, environment, et cetera, et cetera. We started off the same as well. And we thought about this idea after a while and we thought about it as like, like the, the biblical thing, yes? You can't put sort of new things in, in old, 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 old containers. And we thought that this isn't the way to approach the problem. This is too structured a way to approach the problem. We should approach the problem from the other way. We should approach the problem how a machine thinks about. So what we thought about is how could self-learning machines affect humanity in cities? That is how we reframed the question. We reframe the question to say that how could self-learning machines impact humanity in cities? And what does that mean? What does self-learning mean here? It means that you are learning from observations, similar to this sort of thing I mentioned to you about Pac-Man or, or AlphaGo or anything like that. So you need to have a machine which has the ability to maintain or, or, or track lots and lots of observations. Um, and it must learn from lots and lots of data. So it must have positive and negative influences, but you don't train the machine. You let the machine observe things and you let it learn after that. Then we thought about what it would mean for new services for culture and citizens. Now culture is important because we don't want to just look at technology. We want to see how it impacts the lives of people. And as we will see in the next few slides, uh, there is a huge impact to, um, to, to, the, to the lives of people. And of course, what are the threats? And we decided to make it um, a pragmatic disruptive and a positive attitude. So we tried not to think about uh, sort of the, the threats of it. We also tried not to go to, too deep down into the algorithms of it to explain this particular discussion. The reason for that is because I think that if when I speak to people in smart cities about this topic, uh, this is beyond most people's sort of frame of, frame of reference. Uh, what they see is that they have seen this subject they understand it from looking at the news, but they don't see what it really means to them. Yes, and, and perhaps what is needed here is the ability to tell the story and to connect the dots. Yes, so we started off with cities we know best in Spain, uh, partly because of the relationships we already have. Uh, and of course, I have more relationships uh, with other cities as well, but we started off with, with cities we knew. Uh, and we then started off with some of the students who, who went through a whole bunch of different ideas and stories and looked at how these self-learning machines could impact humanity in future cities. And this is how we reframe the question of deep learning with smart cities. And that I think most people do understand. If you, if you talk to the city heads about this particular problem, if you reframe the deep learning question in this way, then they get it, yes? Because we are not talking about algorithms, we are not talking about the things I talked to you about, reinforcement learning or convolutional neural networks and things like that. All I'm talking to you about is think about a machine which will self-learn, and how will it impact you in the next five or 10 years? So, well, we started off with things which, uh, which, which, which look at things which, uh, which can learn from data and observations. Now, I've got lots and lots of these things. I won't go into lots of these details with this. My objective, hopefully, is to have more of a discussion uh, between this time frame. Um, so I will highlight some of the things which we talked about. I, have to, I don't have too many pictures here either because I think most of you would, would know what these things are. So deep learning algorithm paints on the style of any artist it copies. So this is copying and copying and learning bit is very important to us because the copying and learning bit is what is going to distinguish deep learning from anything else. We are trying to see what is the machine copying. Yes, what, is, what can it copy? How fast can it copy? How can you accelerate that copying 
Therefore, how can we accelerate that learning? Yes, so what are we looking at? The deep learning algorithm paints the any sign of artists it copies. Um, then it looks at things such as uh, an intelligent drone from MIT, which avoids crashes and flies at 30 miles per hour. Uh, we look at machines which can see depression in, per, in a person's face. We look at machines which can detect lies. Uh, all this is real, by the way, yes? These are actually things which we have found out, and we are trying to analyze more, more of them. I'm not making these things up. Yes, so these are real things happening now in research laboratories somewhere. We try to see how they apply to smart cities in the future. Uh, deep, deep learning machines can help to predict online gam uh, gambling addictions. Uh, machines which recognize hidden facial expressions. All of these have the thing in common that the machine is able to observe something and infer something based on, based on that observation. Uh, machines we can detect uh, based on people's diameter, like how, 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 how your eyes change to something. Then we talk about Machines which can train other machines. Yes, machines which can teach other machines. Machines which can teach other machines by uh, to grasp things. Yes, machines which can teach uh, things that I, one machine has learned something, perhaps to take 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 this object and leave it down there. But after observing that for some time, another machine learns from that first machine by observing the first machine. Yes, we're trying to understand that at the secondary stage where machines could learn from other machines. Yes, um, then we talk about what kind of data is being used to train machines. So for example, IBM Watson does a lot of work by, by trying to get uh, lots of medical data onto machines. We're trying to learn what that means and what type of other data could you get. We're trying to understand machines which understand emotions and ethics. So things which uh, read Shakespeare, machines which read Shakespeare, machines which detect sarcasm, uh, machines which can create their own stories by, by uh, collecting events and trying to create their own uh, story. Uh, machines which can be funny, machines which can detect emotions, uh, machines which can say no to human commands, so they can, they can argue back. Um, then there is talk about uh, things which, uh, uh, a machine which creates other machines but is Darwinian. In other words, that uh, a mom machine creates uh, another machine but says that you are not good enough so I will not include you. So what is the ethics of this? Where does the Darwinian thing stop when machines are creating other machines? And what is the learning process behind this selection of the fittest or not? Yes. Um, then we talked about things which could make an impact, and there are lots and lots of them. So we, we try to keep away from the sort of the shopping things and so on and so forth because there are lots of people doing that. We try to look perhaps more into more sort of complex stuff. So for example, uh, self-driving sailboats to patrol oceans to detect environmental stuff. Uh, people who are using artificial intelligence in prisons, like prison guards and so on. Uh, people who can detect real-time seizure detection uh, through machine learning algorithm. Uh, then of course, Tinder algorithms, as you know, are, they can get more effective at, at choosing your, your right partner or not. Uh, machines like Mitsubishi uses electric um, machines to, 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 to detect distracted drivers and so on and so forth. Uh, starfish killing robots which protect the Great Barrier Reef, uh, something which makes a perfect cup of tea, machine learning thing. Uh, and then finally, there's, there's the sort of risks. What type of risk? Okay, there's a Japanese robot which, which kind of gives exams better and so on. Uh, then what type of risk? Only movies make bad robots. This could be famous bad last words, but uh, what we think there is somebody who said that. Um, then there is all sorts of things which jobs could go. We think this is important. The World Economic Forum says five million. Uh, law firms say that old uh, sort of uh, young, uh, young interns could be replaced. Hitachi has their first artificial intelligence um, uh, uh, boss and so on. So this actually completes my presentation, more or less on time, I believe, within a, within a month, or within a week, uh, sorry, uh, a minute of completing this. And I come back to this original question. I come back to this question that it is not about technology. I come back to this question that deep learning for smart cities is all about machines which can learn um, and teach based on some information without any supervision. And the question then for us is what does it mean for us? Oh, <laughs>